Welcome to uh, a Hadiyun podcast. Uh, I'm Kalev Bindor, Director of Research at Bicom, uh, and I'm in Tel Aviv, joined uh, by Einat Wilf, uh, who's a former member of Knesset and co-author of a fascinating book, The War of Return, uh, which is out in Hebrew, it's been very popular in Israel, and will be coming out in English sometime in the coming year. Einat, thank you for, for, for joining me. Now, you write in the book uh, I think in the, even in the introduction, this book is a product of the recognition by me and my colleague Adi Schwartz that whoever wants peace, if not now, then as soon as possible, must invest in undermining Arab maximalism, no less than Jewish maximalism. What did you mean by that? So the world is focused on the settlements. And the settlements are essentially a form of Israeli or Jewish maximalism maximalism, especially the settlements well within the West Bank, that are basically a way of saying the entire land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, which Jews call the land of Israel, is exclusively ours, and we will settle throughout it. And if you ask diplomats, media people, and just lay people around the world, what is the main obstacle to peace, they will tell you the settlement. So essentially, Israelis, Jews, they want everything and they're making it impossible to make peace based on the idea of two states, a Jewish state, an Arab state, Israel and Palestine. And what we show in the book is that no less than that is the problem of Arab maximalism. And that's something that almost nobody talks about. And we discuss how Arab maximalism is manifested through this idea that the Arabs and the Palestinians called the right of return, which is essentially the idea that millions of Arabs who uh, fled from the areas during the war for partition, the war for Israel's independence, the war that Arabs opened in order to prevent the emergence of the state of Israel and lost, that Arabs who fled during that war uh, and their millions of descendants have a superior right to settle in Israel, well within Israel, within the pre-67 lines, thereby, because of the numbers, turning the Jews into a minority in an Arab country. And in case anyone is not aware, Jews being a minority generally and certainly in Arab countries didn't turn out too well. Um, so this is the idea, this is the idea that Palestinians have been holding on to for 70 years since the end of the war and it's become basically a way of saying actually the war is not over. We may have lost our our battle to prevent Jews immigrating to the land. We, pr uh, we lost the diplomatic battle to prevent the vote of partition in the United Nations. We lost the war against uh, the birth of Israel. But it doesn't mean that we're done. The war is not over. And the key element of that is the idea of keeping alive uh, the idea of the right of return of Arab refugees, even though they're not refugees. And this is really a form of Arab maximalism because it basically says from the river to the sea, Palestine, Arab Palestine, will be free. And the world does literally nothing to curtail that, to oppose that. Uh, in fact, it does exactly the opposite. It sustains that and supports that. So I think every author dreams that they'll bring out a book and then governments will, within a couple of months, uh, alter their policy based on that. But, but actually, the Trump administration in recent days has made announcements about ceasing to fund UNRWA and even changing the definition of, uh, of Palestinian refugeeism. I mean, how do you feel about that? So like all overnight stories, when you delve into them, you see that there was a decade of work, if not a lifetime of work, behind it. So I, Adi, we have been working on this issue for at least a decade. I started working on it uh, when I was a member of parliament. In fact, Fathom was one of the first to publish some of my works on highlighting the fact that UNRWA is one of the, if not the main obstacles 
to peace. I have lobbied numerous governments in Europe, Australia, the United States, previous administrations to change their policy and I have lobbied Israel and the Israeli political system uh, to change the protection that they have given UNRWA for 50 years. Uh, and then it all comes together and perhaps you needed a, pres a president who seems to want to defund anything that is all caps and uh, you know an acronym and in general anything that has the words UN in it uh, but it, that also has this penchant for kicking stale beltway orthodoxies kind of everyone thinks that the problem is A and he seems to have the temperament to disagree with that and what Adi and I have been able to do for the last couple of years is to give serious intellectual backing even before the book was out through a variety of op-eds and briefings that actually taking on UNRWA touching this idea of return sending a clear message against Arab-Palestinian maximalism not only is it not the wrong thing to do it is the thing that is with good follow-up can actually open the path to peace. So you've been very critical of Western donors for funding UNRWA, but you've also been critical of Israel for allowing UNRWA to continue. Um, but then there's, there's also this, what we've, we've been reading since the Trump decision, is there were a variety of Israeli security officials who said that losing UNRWA would create a vacuum, that it would be dangerous, uh, that it could generate violence. So what are you, I know you've written about that, but what, what are your thoughts on, on that uh, argument? So we've been very critical of the security establishment's position, which has been the same for 50 years, ever since 67, when, which is the first moment that Israel comes to possess territory where UNRWA operates, before that it was beyond Israel's borders. And the thinking at the time was, who knows what the future of the territories will be? This was a six-day war, so everyone was scrambling. Who knows what the future will be? Uh, if in the meantime there's this organization that is providing some health care and education services, let them continue. Fifty years later, we are still in that position, and the military has become the number one lobbyist for UNRWA in Western capitals. And we have been very critical of that because we said maybe, and even that we dispute, funding UNRWA buys us short-term quiet, which is what is the military position. But it has been at the extremely high price of long-term conflict because when Palestinians demand return, which is basically they demand to settle within Israel, west of the 67 line, when Palestinians demand that, that's one thing. But when they feel that this demand is not just their own personal demand, it is a right that is internationally sanctioned, and they get money every year from Western capitals, which sends them the message that they should go on believing that Israel is temporary and one day it will be undone, that extends the conflict, that costs lives and we have argued that people have got it completely in reverse it's not that UNRWA has been moderating a difficult situation or alleviating something that is harsh it's exactly the opposite UNRWA has been one of the main creators of the difficult situation because uh, one of our key uh, insights in the book, and it surprised Adi and myself, is that Palestinian nationalism has three parents, right? Three parents very popular today, so one parent, of course, is Zionism. Without opposition to Zionism, a, pa a, a separate Palestinian identity doesn't emerge. The second parent is Arab rejectionism. If Arabs had agreed to absorb uh, the Palestinians, agreed to accept partition, then there would not have been a separate Palestinian identity. And the third and surprising parent is UNRWA. UNRWA, we have shown, had created, became a womb 
throughout the, the refugee camps, the, the school system, it created the environment in which a separate national Palestinian identity emerged, and not just any kind of identity. A national identity uh, focused on state building and independence is great. What emerged was a separate Palestinian identity essentially focused on revenge fantasies. One that is single-mindedly focused on the idea of undoing Israel, undoing Zionism, uh, this idea of return, an Arab Palestine from the river to the sea. And we're showing that all the terrorists of the Munich massacre, the plane, airplane hijackings, they were all children of UNRWA. And our argument is that UNRWA has been a radicalizing force in the region and in the conflict. And therefore, any notion that it does good is completely uh, mistaken. And the services that UNRWA provides, which are really just something it does so that it can be the facade behind which it hides its political agenda of perpetuating this Palestinian ethos of return, uh, the services of healthcare and schooling can be provided by the local authorities. The Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza, the Jordanian government in Jordan. You don't need UNRWA. So I think that's, I'm not sure how comprehensive the Trump plan is, but I think one of the things in the book, which, which I haven't seen as part of the, the current um, scenarios, is you actually give suggestions of, of what can replace it. So in Gaza, you talk about a Gaza rehabilitation fund yeah. rather than UNRWA. In the West Bank, you talk about the PA. In, in Syria, you, you, you talk about how, I mean, you, you also talk about how a lot of the numbers of refugees need to be uh, reassessed. I'd be interested kind of to hear your ideas uh, along those lines. So we need to understand that UNRWA operates in five areas. West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. In all of these areas, it registers 5.3 million refugees. Now, almost none of them would be considered refugees by international standards. Uh, within the Kingdom of Jordan, 40%, 2.2 million, are citizens of Jordan. In no other situation in the world are citizens also refugees. So, they're not refugees. Uh, within the West Bank and Gaza, these are people who are still, certainly by their accounting, in Palestine. As someone who fled from Lida to Nablus is not a refugee of Palestine. They're still in that territory. So that's another 40%, another 2.1 million people who live in the West Bank and Gaza are not refugees. In Syria and Lebanon, another million are counted. We know by now that that number is at least four times inflated because most of them have long ago left Syria and Lebanon. You know, the father of supermodels, Gigi and Bella Hadid, who's a multimillionaire living in Los Angeles, is still on the books of UNRWA in Syria as a refugee from Palestine. So we know those numbers are inflated. And of those, let's say, 250,000 who actually still reside in Syria and Lebanon, only the original ones who fled war would be considered refugees. And by the way, if they had been treated like other refugees in the world, they would have been long ago resettled and taken off the books. Now, in each of these areas of operations, there is an alternative to UNRWA. In Jordan, Jordan has a health care system, an education system. It can provide it. And by the way, in Jordan, 82% of those who are registered as refugees don't even live in camps. They live in Amman. And even those who live in camps, the camps are no longer camps. They're neighborhoods. So even the words are wrong and misleading. In the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority has a health care and education system. There's a Palestinian Ministry of Education. They can provide, they can take over the UNRWA schools. They can do so in Gaza as well. And if not, you can have a separate authority. But there's no reason uh, to say that there's no replacement for UNRWA. There are replacements in place. In Syria and Lebanon, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees can take over the services, but with the view to ending the status of the refugees, transferring the services to Syria, Lebanon, to private hands, and ultimately 
taking the refugees off the books, not through this idea of return. Now it's important for me to say, when the Palestinians finally forgo the idea that they can destroy Israel and overrun Israel and focus on building their own state in the West Bank and Gaza, they will have that state, and then they can enact a law of return for anyone of Palestinian descent. That's entirely legitimate. What is not legitimate is to demand to settle within the sovereign state of Israel. You have a great phrase, um, I think maybe you used it in one of the Fathom Forums that we did with you, west um, which is the idea that you know, the international community say, well, ev- you know, everyone knows, the Palestinians know that they're not really going to come back. It's, it's a negotiating tool or it's, it's just something they say. But really, when it comes down to it, they, they, they know that they're not coming back. But, but you completely reject that um, in- assumption. Entirely. First of all, I have a tendency to take people at their word. And this is why I invented this term of West planning, like mass planning. Uh, the Palestinians will tell everyone, every journalist, we saw it in the last few months during those marches of return. They tell you, we are going to take back our homes. By now, this is not their homes. This is a fifth generation of Palestinians who are born in Gaza and live there all their lives. But they say, we are from there. This is ours. We're going to take it back. And then you hear journalists saying, oh, they are uh, protesting uh, the humanitarian conditions in Gaza. And I'm always like, did you seriously just listen to them, to what they just said? They're telling you what they're protesting for what they're fighting for, and you're West planning that away. So West planning is basically when Western diplomats and journalists explain away what Arabs and Palestinians have just said. Also, let's think for logic for a moment. Let's say the Palestinians indeed, as the internet or the diplomatic community says, they know they're not returning, it's a negotiating card, they're not serious about it. So two logical uh, quizzes. The first is, The Palestinians look at the map, they see 7 million Jews living among 450 million Arabs, 1.2 billion Muslims, and they say to themselves, this is not going to last long. So they're, they're actually the rational ones. When they think of return, when they think Israel is temporary, they, they're being rational and looking at the numbers. And again, if you really think it's never going to happen, Why again and again, in the year 2000, in the year 2008, on other opportunities, they could have had in negotiations a state of their own in the West Bank and Gaza, independence, freedom, liberty, sovereignty. Why would they give up all that to continue fighting for something that they know they're not going to get? Do people have such a low regard for the Palestinians? The Palestinians are actually demonstrating through their actions, decade after decade, that they're incredibly serious about it and that they're willing to pay an incredibly high price in order not to forgo this idea. I think one of the recommendations you bring in your book is, is for the Western states, even if they are going to continue to uh, give money to or which you don't think they should, they should... Um, have alongside it some sort of statement which is their position on the right of return. Is that, is that correct? Exactly. Over the decades, the Palestinians have taken the Western financial support for UNRWA as political support for their demand to return. Often when I've spoken with Western diplomats, they're like, oh, we're not saying anything about that. On this, I side with the Palestinians. I'm saying, look, if you're giving money to something after seven, for 70 years, uh, it's very hard to say that you don't support what this organization stands for. So I'm saying, even if you give the money, at least make it clear, make a resounding statement that says, dear Palestinians, you are not refugees. There is no right of return but we're giving you some money because we like you. Fine. But it's high time to start sending this message. And I'll explain why this is so critical for peace. Because a lot of people tell me, 
what? If there's going to be no UNRWA and no money for UNRWA, the Palestinians will stop dreaming of an Arab Palestine from the river to the sea. They will stop harking back to a past before Israel existed. I'm like, no, of course, we're not getting into their minds. Of course, they're going to continue dreaming of it, wanting it. But there's a huge difference between what they want as individuals, as a people, and what they think is supported by the entire world. If they are isolated in that demand, if morning, day, and night, just like in the case of settlements, they would hear, this is not a legitimate demand. We don't support you. You cannot settle within the state of Israel. We will only support you if you want to stay in the West Bank and Gaza. You substantially increase the likelihood that a Palestinian leadership would emerge that would tell their people enough. If we mobilize our resources, we can have a state for ourselves in the West Bank and Gaza. The world will support us in that. Israel will support us in that. But as long as we continue to hold on to this idea of return, nothing will happen. So we have to let go of that. We can tell stories. We can ha have poems. We can sing songs. But we're done. We're only focused on building a state. You can only increase the likelihood of such a Palestinian leadership emerging if you make it clear to them that th their demand is not legitimate. So this links into another, I think, really great phrase that you have. You, you talk about how during Oslo, one of the assumptions was this idea of the need of constructive ambiguity. Um, but you actually said, you, you talk about the problems of that and you suggest uh, a new paradigm which is constructive specificity. Yes. Um, which I think to a certain extent the international community already do regarding certain final status issues, um, generally the ones that, that move more towards the Palestinian positions than the Israeli positions. But uh, I, I'd just be really interested to hear what, for you to expand that concept of constructive specificity on the refugees in particular, but also in terms of final status issues in general? So, we, so ever since Oslo, we talk about, about five final status issues. Palestinian statehood, the borders, the settlements, uh, Jerusalem, and refugees. And the thing is that on four of these issues, like you said, the international community had no problem weighing in clearly in favor that there should be a Palestinian state, that the borders, by and large, should be the 67 lines, give or take land, but if there's give, there should be land swaps. Uh, on the issue of Jerusalem, clearly refusing to recognize even the western part of Jerusalem, that is, as I like to call it, humdrum, boring neighborhoods, nothing holy Jerusalem, even that is not recognized, uh, no embassies have moved there. Um, calling the eastern part occupied Palestinian territory, so weighing on this issue. Um, and, uh, and then we come, uh, and of course on the settlements, the world is entirely unanimous in telling that they're not legitimate, they should not exist, Israel should dismantle them, they're never recognized, not even the ones that are adjacent to the Green Line. So the world has no problem weighing in on those issues. And they somehow don't feel that they need to spare our feelings, uh, the Israeli or Jewish feelings on these issues. Suddenly, when it comes to the issue of refugees, you hear phrases like, we don't want to prejudice a final status issue. But they are prejudicing it every day by supporting UNRWA, by inflating the numbers. And, um, and the thing is that this is where you really need the world to weigh in and be very clear and to say, you are not refugees you can have a law of return when you have the state of Palestine, which we, the international community, support, but settling within the state of Israel is illegitimate. Just like we are saying that for the Israelis, the Jews, to settle east of the Green Line, we say it's illegal and illegitimate, we're telling you that for you to demand to settle within the sovereign state of Israel is also illegal and illegitimate. No, 
quiet on this issue. And I sincerely think that we are more likely to get closer to peace, to get to a reality and even to an agreement of a two-state uh, situation or solution if the world is specific on all five issues in a way that ultimately says there will be a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, it will have its capital in Arab East Jerusalem, Israel can annex the settlements adjacent to the Green Line in return for territory swap, the holy part of Jerusalem, which I fondly call Insanity Central, the one square kilometer that everyone imagines when they say Jerusalem, that will be jointly managed for the benefit of humanity, and the, within the state of Israel, there is no such thing as a demand of return, and the Palestinians can enact a law of return within their state, and all settlements that are not in, adjacent to the Green Line will have to be dismantled. This is a clear, specific vision that is fair, I think that is equal, and that ultimately helps both sides move forward. So I think... For me, what's interesting about that is, is a lot of people, especially Trump supporters or even, or even people in the Israeli government who are cheering the weakening of UNRWA are, let's say, ambivalent at best towards a two-state solution. A lot of them would just, they, they see it more as a weakening of Palestinian nationalism. But you're coming from a place um, of, of the left um, as someone who very much supports the paradigm of two states for two people. So it's it's just it's an it's an interesting angle that I think a lot of people may not have, have heard that from that position you're saying that UNRWA is so problematic and the right of return is so problematic. Exactly. I think in many ways it's what makes it makes it possible for me to be both passionate and effective when I speak about this issue. Uh, because I am clear that at the end of the day I'm not about being mean to the Palestinians and I'm not about uh, denying their equal and universal right to self-determination just like I insist on the equal and universal right of the Jewish people to self-determination but I am going I think thoroughly and logically through all the implications of what that means and looking at it from both sides and I've certainly uh, encountered that when I meet Western diplomats and I speak against UNRWA, my strong, the, the reason that I can speak effectively about it is that when they speak, for example, against the settlements and they say, but you have people who also say that they need to occupy or live in every square inch that the Jews ever had any connection to, I can say, I agree with you, that is the mirror image. The mirror image of the Palestinian demand of return, which is we want every square inch of Palestine, is the settler vision of we want every square inch of the land of Israel. And I sometimes joke that my work as a peacemaker is to fight uh, Jewish maximalists at home, so to write, and I do, against the settlements in Israel, uh, but then to fight Arab maximalists abroad and to expose to the international community that still one of the main obstacles to peace is the Arab expectation that the land will one day be entirely Arab with Jews at best a subservient minority. Great. Uh, Enad, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Sure. My pleasure.